We're continuing our series on being thankful in every situation. And now we come to this situation of contentment. That really that how contentment is related to being thankful. Because contentment will affect your thankfulness. And the same is true that being um, not content if we're uh, if we're not if we're the opposite of content discontent that's going to affect how we see things and affect how we're going to be thankful philip parham tells a story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat why aren't you out there fishing he asked well the fisherman said because i've caught enough fish for today well, why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. What would I do with them? Well, you can earn more money, came the impatient reply, and buy a better boat so you can go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, catch even more fish, and make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman then asked this man, then what would I do? Well, you could sit down and enjoy life, said the industrialist. What do you think I'm doing now, the fisherman replied as he looked out to the sea. The fisherman was content with what he had. There's also a story I came across of this man. He was not happy. He was discontent. He saw, he looked with jealousy to his friends and saw that they had nicer homes, bigger homes than he did. So what does he decide to do? He decides that he's going to put his house listed up on the market to get it sold so he wants so that he can buy another house and so he meets with the realtor gets it put he gets it put uh, in the ads he he gets it listed that's the sell well a little bit later He's going through the, the classifieds he's looking at the ads and he sees his home and he reads a description on it and as he reads he's like this is the perfect home. For me, so he calls up his realtor and tells him, I need to look at this home. This is the perfect home for him. So the realtor asks, what is this home? And the guy is going to describe it. And the man replies back, the realtor says, that's your home that you just listed. See, dis being discontent affects our view of things. And so that's why we come first. The question is, am I content or am I complaining? So am I content or am I complaining? And so think about what is the difference between contentment and complaining. Sam Crabtree writes this, Instead of thinking the cup is half empty, the thankful heart is grateful that the cup is half full. Because we always, and I'm going to stop there and pause there for a moment in this quote. Because we often think about people, that talk about different views. Is the, ca is the cup half empty? Is it half full? And so there's that question and how you look at things. And so that's why he says instead of thinking the cap, that the cup is half empty, the thankful heart is grateful that it is, even, it is even half full and that there's even a cup at all. The complaining heart not only sees the cup as half empty, but as too small in the first place. And the stuff in the cup isn't the stuff it wants. The contented heart has enough. Sometimes the complaining heart has too much, and by doing without, the soul can suffer, discover appreciation for what was previously taken for granted or complained about. And that is true. There's times when we look at things and we start complaining, and we really have too much, and then we lose some things, and it really changes our perspective on, on, on things. It makes us thankful. And grateful. I mean, there are those who were went through the Great Depression, had very little. That was a hard, difficult time where people lost money. They lost their jobs. They lost their businesses. That when the stock market crashed and going through that whole entire decade of of having little, but yet they learned to appreciate what they had. And so we got to be thankful and take a step back. Because we know that g complaining is sin, and, and it's not just a little sin. God hates complaining. 
I mean, that is one of the sins that Israel committed repeatedly in the wilderness. I mean, think about this. It, we, we can take a, we can look at them and say, oh, well, we would do better, but would we? I mean, sometimes I think we might do what they did, but even though, let's put ourselves in their place, they had witnessed the ten plagues that God brought against Egypt. Okay? They witnessed those things. What God had done to Egypt where a few of them started, a few of the plagues affected them, but then God transitioned. He said, going to make a difference between them and Egypt. And so the majority of them, plagues affected only Egypt, and they witnessed that. I mean, hailstorm, they witnessed the, the crops being destroyed, locusts, frogs, the list goes on and on, finally to the death of the, of the firstborn. And Pharaoh did, ended up doing exactly what God said they would in Egypt, that they would plunder Egypt. I mean, they had just plundered Egypt. God had given them all these things for wages of their slavery. They were slaves for over 400, for, for, for most of the time they were there. And God gave them stuff. But they haven't even been gone from Egypt that long. The plagues should be fresh in their minds. They've seen God's power, what God had done. How God made a distinction between them, even in darkness, where the darkness was so thick that you could feel it. But it was daylight where, they, where Israel was at. They witnessed those things. They, had, they were given wealth when they left. But no sooner than they left... They're complaining. Exodus 14, 10 through 11. When Pharaoh changes his mind, he comes after them. It describes, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to God, out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away here to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? You think about this mindset that they, as I just described, they witnessed these things. God had given them this wealth that they haven't had. And the first thing they think about is that instead of crying, you know, it was okay to become frightened. That's a scary thing. They didn't, they didn't defeat Egypt with their might. God defeated them, the most powerful army at that time in the world. It's okay to be frightened. But you know what they should have done? God, we believe that what you've done, we know that you'll take care of us. Please help us. No, no. Are there, you know, thinking God just took them out here so they can die. When God had promised to take them to the promised land. Then God took care of that situation. They witnessed God parting the Red Sea. God drowning Pharaoh's army. And then a few days later, they complain, we don't have any water. Exodus 15, 22 to 24. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness ashore, and went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Then they came to Marah. They could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? They grumbled, grumbled, complaining, rather than, hey, you know, God, please provide us water. They could have prayed and asked God for water. I'm sure there was, a, there was some of them that did. But the majority of people were complaining. Then they complained when they didn't have food. Exodus 16, 2-3. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. What they should have done is believe God would take care of them. And then we know that God sent manna. For 40 years God sent manna. All they had to do was step foot out of their tent and gather it. That's all you had to do. You gather what you needed. When it came, on, when it came for Friday, you had to gather for Saturday. 
That's the only day you had to gather double what you needed, and God would send that extra. So for 40 years, God sent this manna, this food. But you know what? They complain about that. That's not good for them, good enough for them. Uh, Numbers 11, 4 through 6, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onion, onions and the garlic. Now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to look, except, uh, to look at except this manna. They had food. They had food. It's almost comical to think because as well, I mean, God is taking care of them, providing water for them and their flocks, providing food for them and their flocks when they could, you really could eat some of those animals. But you're complaining, 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 complaining. It's never enough. They complained, complained. And God ends up sending them, sends them the quail. And God's up killing some of them because they were doing it greedily without, and not thanking God. Then they complained about the people of the land because it took them two years to get there because God took them slowly because they, so so they depend upon Him. They complained about people of the land because too strong, they're too strong. Even though God is the one that defeated Egypt, the mo- as I said, the most powerful nation, army at that time, they didn't have to fight, but it was... 12 spies that gave, I mean, 10 out of the 12 spies that gave the bad report. Because you know that song from, from Sunday school, 10, 10 were bad and 2 were good. You had Joshua and Caleb that gave the good reports that believed that, yeah, oh yeah, it is true that these, guys, these men are tall. They're, they're, their cities are fortified, but we believe God. If God wants us to have this, He's going to give it to us. He can defeat them. But they complained. And it's almost comical because some of the stuff repeats itself. Some of these same complaints. Numbers 13, 31 through 33. The men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. I mean, they don't believe that, yeah, they're too strong for us, but they're not too strong for God. Did God not defeat Egypt two years prior? Did God not just part the, did he not just part the Red Sea? Did he not just provide for the manna? Did he not just provide for the quail? Did he not provide water by, have, I mean that water was turned sweet by, by casting a, a tree in it? I mean normally you don't put a tree in something and it filters the, but here that you had that miracle that God provided water. It repeats it over. God is gracious to them, but they complain. It's never enough. It's never enough. They're not a thank. They're not thank. Most of them are not thankful. I'm not gonna. There's gonna be those like Joshua and Caleb that are gonna be thankful for the manna, thankful for the water, thankful for what God has done, thankful that God provided water from a rock twice. You know, I mean. All these things God taking care of for them, that a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, the cloud that, I mean, just even the desert, the sun beats over your head, and the cloud provides not only God leading them, but also cover as well. Their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out. How many of us can say our shoes can last 40 years in our clothing? But it's never enough. It's never enough. It's never enough for them, for, for a lot of them. Complaining is a characteristic of that sin nature. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But realize this that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless 
conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. So complaining is, it's listed in this that of all these characteristics of ungodliness. That's why to complain is really to complain against God. That's what Moses told Israel. In Exodus 16, 8, Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. Grumbling and complaining is against God. That complaining does not think that what God has given me is good enough, or that God is treating me right, or that what he gave me is for my good. This type of thinking thinks if I had enough, if I had more, then I will be satisfied. But the truth is, you'll never be satisfied, because greedy greed is never satisfied. I mean, there was a recent poll, and I forget the the, the exact numbers, but it said, what would it take? How much money would it take to make you happy? And and men and women gave different um, different responses, but it wasn't always, you know, it wasn't millions of dollars. It was basically several hundred thousand dollars because of, um, I know that they take these polls every now and then it increases because of the way the economy is and inflation, that it takes more money now to buy the same stuff. But they were just saying, if I had this money, it was way, it was more than what somebody actually would need to live on. But they think, then I'll be happy. Uh, then I'll be ha satisfied. But if you're not happy with what you have, then why would you be happy when you get what you think will make you happy? Because then it won't be enough even then. Because whatever situation you are, we're really to give thanks to God and rather than complaining. Contentment is satisfied with how things are. Being satisfied with what God has given me. I mean, Hebrews 13, 5-6 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor I will ever leave you. So, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man, what will man do to me? Content with what you have. Content with what God has given me. That God has given me. God has treated me better than I ever even deserve. And so because you're content, you give thanks to God for what He has done and what He has given to you. Now, being content does not mean that you, that you cannot find a solution to solve a difficult problem. It doesn't mean that you resign yourself. Well, I am content, then, you know, we don't need to find any solutions. That's not what, content, that's not what contentment means. Contentment is being satisfied, it's being thankful, but when there are problems, we still look for solutions. Sam Crabtree writes this, Even though we are to be thankful for everything, including difficulties like illnesses, we work diligently to creatively eliminate these very problems. Christians dig wells, build clinics, and teach literacy. The contentment that breeds thankfulness is not complacency. Christians thank God for the problems, but that doesn't mean we don't seek solutions and thank God for these solutions when they come. I mean, if we get cancer, we, we ought to give thanks for God and knowing that God is going to take care of us, but we're going to go to the doctors and we're going to you know, take some treatments. If we break a leg, or break a bone, we're going to be, we still ought to thank God for his goodness and kindness, he's taking care of us. We thank God for the doctors and the hospitals, but we're going to get a cast on us. On us. And if it's a finger, or they usually put a little splint there. We're going to, we look for solutions. That when we see people who are hungry, we can give them what they, what they need. So we look for solutions. And we thank God for those. We thank God for problems and solutions. So contentment is not to be complacent and resign oneself that, that you cannot look for a solution to a problem. But you thank God for these things. And then, secondly, we could be content 
even while groaning. Now what does that mean? You could be content, yet still groan. Groaning is different than complaining. Because we, we just heard a few moments ago and that complaining and contentment cannot coexist. I cannot be complaining and be content and thankful. I'm either going to be complaining and discontent and grumbling, or I'm either going to be going to be content and thankful and giving praise to God. So those two things cannot coexist. That's why a Bible says this. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And so, you know, and, and we look at other verses, it says, and everything give thanks. And so, these things cannot coexist, but how do we live in a fallen world when there's suffering and problems? And at the same time, we don't complain about it. How do we acknowledge suffering and yet be thankful and content? It doesn't matter if it's our own suffering or the suffering of others. Well, Romans 8, 22 through 23 tells us this. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together. Until now, and not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The word that is used here for groaning means to moan or to sigh. It's a deep sigh, deep groaning. The Bible says that creation groans because of the curse of sin. It groans and suffers. We groan and suffer because it even says we ourselves groan within ourselves. We groan because of suffering while waiting for Christ's return. Creation groans because of the curse of sin. The picture in this verse is used of childbirth. Suffers the pains of childbirth. And so we have this picture of childbirth. If you ask a woman in the midst of childbirth how she feels, she's not going to tell you everything feels great. No problems at all. Give you a thumbs up. You know, she's going to be crying out pain. Gasping for air between the birth pangs as they get more intense. There's a reason that they offer women epidurals for the pain. But when your baby was born, think about that. When your baby was born, you just went through all that pain. But when your baby was born and you're holding your child so close, you wouldn't trade that baby for all that pain you went through. In this fallen world, there's pain and suffering. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to cry. It's okay to moan in pain. It's okay to sigh. It's, it's okay. And there are times we're going to find it hard to pray in the midst of the groaning. Can't get out the words that we want to. But we have a helper, the Holy Spirit, who changes our prayers to what they need to be. Romans 8, 26-27, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He Himself searches the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That He Himself groans as well. Creation groans. We groan. The Holy Spirit groans. But His groaning is different than our groaning. It's one of interceding of prayers that it says that we do not know how to pray as we should. But He does. He searches our hearts. He knows what the mind is. Because He intercedes. And so we can groan, but be content. But here we can go through suffering and be content and thankful at the same time. Most of you probably have heard of Joni Erickson Tata. She was left paralyzed at the age of 17 due to a, a diving accident. Going in a pool. Having a fun time diving and hits, hits the bottom of the pool. 
Instead of complaining, she has learned to live with the difficulties of living a life, living a life in a wheelchair for decades. Probably at least, I think, I think over 40 years. I think it was actually around the time shortly before or after I was, uh, when I was born. But instead of complaining, she learned to deal with that and learned to give thanks for God, even for that wheelchair. Give thanks to the Lord in the midst. And so even though we groan because of suffering and sickness and difficult times, listen to what Paul states in that passage. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And he says this before he goes into the groanings. The sufferings of this present time. That here we have this short life. We have sufferings. We have groanings. We suffer here. But when we get to heaven, that's not going to matter. It all changes. Just like the example of childbirth. Going through all that pain, all that suffering. That's why the Bible says that she forgets when she holds that child. I mean, you probably don't ever forget. But in that moment you went through, it was worth it all. When we get to heaven, it's going to be worth it all. That I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. It's going to be worth it. It's not even worthy to be compared to the glory when we get to heaven. The sufferings of this life are but for a moment, but the glory of heaven is eternal. And so the next time we're, so the next time we're tempted to be complain. You must be careful. When you start, you need to tell yourself to stop. The author of the the book I've been basing the study on would tell himself he would tell he would name his name and tell him to tell him to self to shut up. We could just say stop talking, you know, just stop talking. Tell ourselves to stop talking. To stop it. Then instead of complaining, give thanks to God in that situation. Thank Him for His love and patience. Thank Him that He works all things together for good. Those are just a few examples. We can groan, but still give thanks to God. We can do so by Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, what is ever honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, what is lovely, what is ever of good repute, If there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, dwell on what? These things. doesn't say to dwell on the things that are bad. The things that are suffering. Dwell on these things. And we're going to find as we are content, content even while groaning, Contentment brings peace. The Bible tells us that contentment, is, we're really commanded. We're commanded to, to be content. But I want you to think about for a moment, why does contentment bring peace? Think about that. Why does contentment bring peace? Well, if we're discontent, complaining and grumbling, are we trusting God? I mean, think about what Israel is doing. Were they trusting God when they're complaining about, oh, God brought us out to here to die. Egypt's going to get, you know, Pharaoh's going to get us to die, going to get us when God parted the Red Sea. He who had the power to change the rivers to red, make the darkness only be on Egypt, had the power to part that Red Sea. Change the bitter water to water they could drink, provide them food. The list goes on and on and on of things. But did they ever complain? I mean, ever get, they didn't, they were complaining. They weren't trusting God. They were never, they weren't trusting God. The majority of them were not trusting Him. That's why they said, oh, we're just here to die. God doesn't care about us. And so on and on, so on. 
And so they weren't, and they didn't have peace. So contentment brings peace because you trust in the Lord. You're not worrying. You're not anxious. You're not getting yourself all worked up into a fret. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, what is true, what is ever honorable, what is ever right, whatever is pure, what is lovely, what is ever a good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. It brings peace because you're not being anxious. You're giving thanks. Your prayers and supplications, your needs, your requests, with thanksgiving, and when you trust in God, His peace guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus because you're trusting Him. Your hope is in Him. In all this, you know that God is in control, that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5-6, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For He Himself has said, I will never desert you nor ever leave you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? God will never leave you or forsake you. We don't have to fret and worry. We have peace. Contentment gives peace because I'm trusting God through difficult times. Even while groaning. And then Matthew 6, 31-33. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? or what we will drink, or what we will wear for clothing. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We're content, but we can trust the Lord, but we can still take our prayer requests to God. He says, don't, don't seek first His kingdom. Don't worry about these things. We can take our request to God. And then fourth and last this morning, contentment says, I have more than enough. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is a vanity. Many people think that the more I have, I mean, I'm sorry, if I have more, I will be happy, then I will be content, then I will be thankful. But that's not what it says, that you love money, you will never be satisfied, never be enough. Never enough is reality. You ask me, people, billionaires, most of them would probably say they don't have enough. They want more, they want more, they want more. Now the truth and reality is if you're not content with what you have now, you'll never be content with more. Benjamin Franklin said this, Content makes poor men rich. Discontent makes rich men poor. Because when you're content, you're happy and satisfied. When you're discontent, a person who's rich can be, you know, they, 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 look at, they look at the reality. Is that I don't have enough. I'm poor. Think about the illustration I used of that man who put his house up for sale and ended up responding to the ad that was listed for his home, thinking that's the perfect home for me when he's already living in it. Instead, we rejoice and give thanks for what we have. It's enough. I have enough. But I said, that doesn't mean you can't take your request to God. Even in the mindset, I have more than enough, we can still take our request to God. And the Spirit will intercede for us, pray as we ought to, 
Philippians 4, 4 through 6, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, we'll say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We could even put, in everything, give thanks. Including prayer. And so, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Give thanks. And so, contentment. It, it, when we're content, we're going to find that we're more thankful. We may not have what everyone else has. We may not be millionaires. We may not have a yacht. We might not be a- eating these fancy foods. But even with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we're happy. We're happy because we have food. We don't have to have the lobster and all these fine things that they that they sell to the rich people and the rich people always eat. And it's funny because lobster used to be it used to be a shameful thing a couple hundred years ago to eat lobster. Poor people would eat it in secret. But then it all of a sudden turns to it's a rich person thing. You have all this money for for the lobster. And so even discontent with what I have, what I have, what God has given me, I have what I need, I have more than enough. We really look at probably the we we it is it goes beyond than just even my cup is half full. Really my cup is overflowing. I mean, that picture we could know. If you ever filled up a cup of something, even if it's water, and you accidentally filled it up more than what could fit in that cup, it's overflowing the sides. Well, with contentment, I have it more than enough. It's overflowing. Just as, as David said in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. I have more than enough. And so let us be content with thanksgiving to the Lord. We give thanks to God for what He has done. And so, and praise, because we don't deserve anything. We deserve, deserve hell. We deserve to suffer for our sins. So anything, I mean, we don't even deserve, we don't deserve salvation. So anything above that is even way more than we ever deserve. And so with salvation and the Holy Spirit and God's Word and God providing for our needs and taking care of us and working things out all together for good, we can look to, the, look to those things. Look, you know, as you continue adding to your list, look to God's Word and look at all the blessings that come from, you, you write those down, I'm thankful to God for, and then just look to Scripture, that the blessings that come from, blessings that, that come from God and how God provides, how God promises to take care of us, His promises, His word, that way more than, than enough, more, way more than we ever deserve. And so we, let us be content with what the Lord has given us. And so continue adding to, to your list of thankfulness.